Welcome, one and all, to episode 101 of the podcast. I hope that you all enjoyed last week's episode, but now we must continue forward and continue working hard. Working hard, just like our main character, Tim Bernard Sara, throughout the entire Shrouded Persona series, which we'll be reading chapter 3 of today. So without further ado, let's just get into it. Chapter 3 The sky is still black and sparkled with stars. My shack is in complete darkness, and the moonlight continues to leak in from my broken windows. It must still be around night time, or at least early morning. I can hardly remember the last time I've woken up this early, but I know it wasn't for anything positive. Well, I'm already awake, so I might as well get started with my day. First thing I need to do is head to the far edge of the border and gather supplies for potions. There's a river near there, and luckily since I, have li- since I live on the edge of Syrian, it won't be that far for of a run. It's been a little while since I've last ran, especially at the pace that I plan on going at. It's not long before I've thrown all of my gear, throw on all of my gear and burst out of the door. The wind flies past my ponytail, and my legs are swinging forwards and back. My arms are moving at a speed that my eyes can't comprehend. This morning, it's pretty chilly, especially for early Punic. I'm glad I don't live in Corbrun, or even Rapard during this time of year, or at all. The heat is always the first thing to penetrate my mind whenever those two nations are mentioned. It doesn't take much time before the border and river comes into view. No man's land that separates all of the nations. It's it's to help lower the risk of war. If our borders aren't that close to each other, then we don't have to worry about trespassers and political upsets. It's better for everyone. My heart is still racing and sweat forms on my body as I walk to the river, keeping my balance as I tread downhill. The usual dry dirt is moist and slippery. It must have rained around here recently, which will especially be good for me. The more rare plants I'm searching for for typically emerge and sprout after rainfall. They only grow within Syrian, which makes it unique to our nation. Once the soil gets dry and dusty again, they will wither away, not even a single hint of their existence being left behind. The closer I get to the clear, sparkling water, the faster my descent comes. My clothes are soaked and lightly stained with the mud, nothing I can't get out. I finally reach the bottom of the hill and stand tall at the edge of the river, taking some metal containers out of my backpack as I begin my search for the different ingredients I can use for potion making. Since I have no potion in mind to make, I'll just grab whatever I can find. Best to pick up everything now so I don't have to worry about not having anything later on. Then, as I trudge through the mud, the rare plants come into my sight. Their heart-shaped petals are full of fluid, and a long, purple stem attached to each heart individually reaches into the earth. Fluid clearly pumping through it like a thin rubber straw, a rungin plant. Its beauty is both exhilarating and alarming. I've only ever seen this plant once before, and it was only in a picture. It was during a presentation of one of my classes at my night school, if my memory serves me right, which I'm sure it does. Uh, Adding even half the petal of a rungan plant can greatly enhance the effects of a potion by 250 times. However, there is a nearly identical plant that can only be found in Ithiate, the caves biome. Except instead of each petal being attached to the stem individually, they are all clustered together in groups of 10 to 15. It's far more dangerous, too. Every single thing of that plant can potentially kill a person, even down to breathing nearby it. It's called a vicon. The educators were quick to present the vicon to us after showing us the rungan. If anything, they were even frantic to show us the rungan's more dangerous evil twin. But even so, I need to be careful of containing this plant because once it loses its ability to suck the water from the earth continuously, then it will die instantly. I didn't bring a jug large enough to con- to contain the amount of water needed to bring it back to my place. And even if I did bring it back to my place, where would I even replant it? 
Not like I can even gather seeds off of it too, because those are always released at the roots shortly before the water is completely sucked up. What the fuck should I do? I mumbled to myself, crouching next to the beautiful plant. The sucking of the stem continues to make me uncomfortable, even though I've seen it happen many times before. But I need this. And with me leaving in six days, I may never get the chance to get it again for a while. It doesn't rain that often around here either. So even if I come here every morning or night, there's not even a chance of the dirt still being moist. I could race back and find something, but I don't know if I even have anything at home that could be good enough. Not to mention the weight of carrying water around. My ears flinch backwards, signaling me of a new presence. Wild yelling and the beating of hooves echoes through the flat through these flat plains, sending birds flying and making some coyotes in the distance perk up their heads. I lay flat on the ground, ignoring my wet and matted hair. Bandits, I mutter, working to conceal my breaths and heartbeat. It doesn't take long before the booming of hooves comes to a near silence, although all the voices continue to yell and shout just above the hill. If they get close enough and look down, then they'll be able to see me. Perhaps if I lay still enough, then they'll just assume that I'm dead. But I ha also have a ton of supplies on me, lots of which can make them more money on the black market than any Ilnakian can even dream of. The footsteps reach to the edge of the hill, and silence makes my ears ring. There are faint mumbles, mumbles with a variety of personalities. Some want to check up on me. Others want to make sure I'm dead by throwing knives at me. Then there's one that especially makes my heart race, too. Two of them suggest to do something unruly and devious to my body. Wait a second, a familiar voice shouts above me, silencing the raspy voices. Dirt and rocks roll down the hill, latching onto my hair and clothes. I recognize her. Yeah, I do, too, a far more familiar voice adds. Then it clicks. It's the volunteers from yesterday. Before I could even lift my head, Daniel rolls over on to my back and holds me in his arms, making sure to keep my hair out of the river. He's got bags under his eyes this morning, which makes sense. We left town late last night and he clearly wasn't up early and he clearly was up early this morning. Though the darkness of the night gives his appearance a more horrific sight, especially with that signature bandit camo headband. He's in a gang. Timber? His voice is deeper than yesterday. It makes the hair on my body stand up, and my consciousness goes into survival mode. Night soldier, I shout, and my fist goes flying straight for his nose. He lets out a yelp, falling backwards as I jump up to my feet. As I watch them all rush down to the river, I unsheathe two blades and hold them in front of me, paying attention to all my senses and taking a deep breath. I allow my past training to take over of my body and reflexes. There are seven of them, one being Daniel and the other being Jackson. Daniel is still cradled on the ground, holding his nose and hiding his watering eyes. Jackson is standing terrified in the middle of the river. His fists are raised, but he clearly isn't confident in his fighting still skills. There's another guy crouching behind Daniel with a hand on his shoulder. The other hand is unidentifiable, so there's the possibility of a weapon. Two of the remaining four hold the exact t same timid body language as Jackson. The last two have sickening looks on their faces, definitely the ones that suggested de the devious activities. I want to slice their heads off, first, but I know that is unwise, especially the, especially the chances of the guy crouched behind Daniel having a weapon and the three of the scared persons possibly be being better at combat than they lead to believe. Timber, wait! Jackson yells as the crouch person begins to stand up. No weapon, and I haven't sensed any vibrations on the ground, so they didn't drop it to the dirt. Shut up, I shout in response. The way my face contorts makes me feel like a snarling wolf. You're in a gang of bandits and thieves. I know those headbands anywhere. No, no, it's not like that. Jackson adds, his entire body shaking and tense. Are you saying that I'm wrong? I snarl, glaring knives into the poor boy's eyes. Well, not exactly. His hands drop to his sides and he stands normally. 
I don't relax and continue to watch everything in my surroundings. We're newbies. Plus, we were sent here to gather some river water for some unknown reason. To drown a traitor, I respond blankly. Everyone except for the two in the back stop entirely and stare up at me in disbelief and shock. Huh. How do you know? It's a tradition for the night soldiers. They use river water on the border of Syrian and Verother and drown them in it. The reasons date back to all the way before the gang was even created, I explain, still holding my prepared formation. Once again, how do you know that? Jackson asks again, still in complete shock. My night school, higher power lifetime school, teaches everyone everything about gangs and traditions by the time they're four. I explain, finally muttering the name of my night school for the first time in a year. Training starts right at birth and you graduate at 16. There's a university option at 18, but I chose to not attend. One of the guys in my, the back takes a step away his once creepy and suggestful look now fearful. His body shivers, and mouth opens and closes with no noise escaping. He points at me, his entire arm shaking. Assassin! He barrels back up the hill, and I send a knife stri flying straight into his spine. He drops to the ground and tumbles back down the hill, laying face first into the running river. He was a few inches away from crushing a rug implant. Luckily, that sick fuck didn't, or else his entire family would have paid. You killed him, one of the fearful members cries. You'll end up having to kill many innocent people if you remain in night soldiers. I respond blankly, finally leaving my protec protective formation. None of these guys are of any harm, not even the last creep who is frozen in fear. Everyone is silent as I sheathe my remaining knife and make my way over to Daniel. His colleague rushes away as I get closer. Some friends they are. Just run away when scared, instead of focusing on protecting their injured ally. They're all cowards. Kneeling down in front of Daniel, I lowers, lower his hands and inspect his nose. Blood pours everywhere, and it's slightly crooked, definitely broken. I don't attempt to smile or comfort him as I begin examining his nose. He's a nice soldier. He doesn't deserve to be comforted. I take hold of the bridge of his nose with one hand and the crooked area with another. Then, with one sharp breath, I push them towards each other. Daniel screams and flails his arms, attempting to smack me as I make sure it's straight. I really should have just knocked him out first. Let go of me, he screams, and I finally release him from my hold. There, I let out a deep breath and stand back up to my feet, making my way over to the dead man in the river. Those knives are expensive. I don't just want to leave him, them there. I didn't even pay for them. They were awarded to me by my school for being a top student. Everyone else takes a step back as I kneel in front of the dead man, reaching for the handle and ripping it out of his spine. Blood splatters, staining my clothes and dirt in the dirt surrounding us. A faint breeze blows through my hair as I spin on my heels and face the rest of the petrified idiots. Gesturing to the rung implant, I nonchalantly ask, Do you guys have any jugs I can use? Um, I... The guy that failed to protect Daniel mutters. Yeah, why? Just get me a jug, I answer, forcing a stone-cold expression onto my face. He gulps and rushes up the hill, not taking long before he comes barreling down again with a glass jug over two times larger than my head. He hands me the jug and timidly asks, what do you need it for? I kneel down next to the river and begin filling up the jug with water, making sure to focus most of my attention on my senses in case to, if they attempt to attack me from behind. With a nod of my head, I gesture to, to the rungan. These are extremely rare and require a lot of water to keep alive. They are also helpful potion making. So I need a jug to fill up with water that's large enough for me to be able to make it home and plant it again. That sounds more like a parasite, Jackson mentions, kneeling next to me and assisting with filling up the jug to the brim. He's oddly calm now, though that's most likely due to his ignorance. It technically is, I answer with a kind smile, preparing to unearth the rungan. He glances at me with confusion, and in the corner of my 
I so do a few of the others. Around a hundred years ago, with Duthius, when Duthius attempted to take over the overworld, they made special plants and attempt to dry out the world and make it so that no living thing could survive. But the Salians quick, quickly tested, started testing on the plants and realized they could be used for potions. There's also the fact that Syrian is a farming nation, so droughts are pretty frequent, meaning that the plants wither away pretty quickly. So it was just a failed attempt to kill us all? Jackson asked, gazing at the Rungan and all. But why not just release their demons or dragons? Surely they'd be much faster than just waiting for our world to dry out. Because their entire world realm is full of lava and fire, so their more effective creatures wouldn't be able to handle the water or the cool air of our land. I answer, and he helps me with lifting up the jug, dragging it next to the plant. The jug is about half a foot larger than the plant, so this should be so this should be just good enough. But how am I going to run it home? How are you going to take it home? One of the other timid guys asked, maintaining a safe distance away from me. I'll figure it out, I answer carefully, and quickly transferring the plant to the jug. The fluid in the heart pedals hastily lessens for a moment, but quickly fills back up. We'll give you a ride home. Daniel finally speaks, still cradling his nose and doing his best to hide the fluid in his eyes. Do you think the plant will survive till then? I smile and nod as Jackson assists me with lifting up the jug. It will, but just slightly, if we leave right now and rush. And that is all for Chapter 3 of Shrouded Personas. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll be including a Q&A below for the Spotify listeners for them to tell me what they think. As for listeners on sites that allow commenting, then feel free to comment below what you thought. Check out my novels Death Trail, Flame Rip, and Arctic Blaze on Amazon and Kobo, link in description. Check out the Crave Ryan Club Patreon, link in description. Check out the Crave Ryan Club Discord server in the description. Check out my personal Instagram at dark underscore night underscore wolves. And let's bring this meeting with an actual outro written in this time to an end.